Hey, hello everybody. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the lunch. I did. Food's pretty good, right? Happy to see that. Good. Um, next up, we're going to be learning from Dr. Rachel Obuov, a dermatologist. Um, she's also a member of our medical advisory board. We're very excited to have her here today. Um, just like with our first presentation, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you have a question, you can write it down on the index cards. And after the presentation, we'll go around and collect those to do that. Um, Dr. Abuov is board-certified dermatologist who practices at Cedar sinai She also works closely with many rheumatologists um, for comprehensive care for people living with lupus and other autoimmune diseases. Um, so very excited to welcome Dr. Abuov. Thanks so much. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Hopefully, I'll try to keep you awake uh, after lunch. Um, thanks for staying. Okay. So, um, like Catherine said, I'm a dermatologist. I'm a general dermatologist, but I took an interest in lupus and other autoimmune diseases uh, well over a decade ago, um, and I found that practice very rewarding. I also find that um, it's hard to find dermatologists who really understand lupus. Um, I have a lot of experience in it, and I still don't know that I truly understand the disease. Um, it tricks me often. Um, and so today I'll just uh, go over some basics of skin lupus and then some of my uh, clinical pearls. Uh, so uh, skin manifestations of lupus. So in systemic lupus, depending on the study you look at, 55 to 90% of patients with uh, systemic lupus have rashes. Um, and rash is often the first sign of illness. And not all patients uh, with skin lupus actually have systemic lupus. So a lot of my practice uh, is involving patients who actually don't have systemic disease but do have a lot of problems with cutaneous or skin lupus. Um, patients who do present with skin lupus, a uh, small percentage of them can go on to um, develop systemic disease. So we watch them closely. And uh, a good rule of thumb is the more extensive the rashes are, or the more different types of rashes we see, the more likely they will eventually meet criteria for systemic lupus. So today I'm going to focus only on the lupus-specific rashes. I could stand up here for hours and talk to you about all the different types of nonspecific rashes that come up in um, lupus patients, um, but I'll focus on these, and you may have already heard of a lot of these. So uh, including the acute lupus rash or the butterfly rash or malar rash, uh, there's the subacute cutaneous lupus, discoid lupus or chronic cutaneous lupus, and some other subtypes as well. So to start, uh, acute lupus is, this is a great example. Um, this is a patient who, um, I don't know if I have the pointer. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So you see the butterfly. So the, the rash is typically defined as a, as a singular plaque that runs from one cheek over the nasal bridge to the other cheek. And it should spare this line over here, the nasal labial fold. Um, it is thickened and scaly and um, doesn't kind of come and go. Um, and that's important because there are a lot of other things that can mimic lupus. And one of the most common things that I get is, um, please evaluate this facial rash and is this lupus or something else? And sometimes it's hard to tell. But these basic rules do uh, apply a lot of the times. So this is 100% of the time associated with systemic disease. And flares follow sun exposure most of the time. And um, you, the rule is when you treat the systemic disease, this butterfly rash will disappear. Subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, this is one example. Sorry, the uh, picture's a little yellow, but um, you can see this, um, this rash pretty well. Um, so depending, again, on which study you look at, 10 to 50% of patients with SCLE will also meet criteria for systemic lupus. Um, we call it the shawl distribution. So you can imagine the um, uh, area that is on the upper chest over the shoulders and the upper back. Um, and we can see um, where the underside of the chin will often not have the rash because sunshine is involved here and the chin will block the sun from hitting underneath the chin. Um, and sun exposure is most definitely a trigger in most patients. And it, even um, UVA light, which is long wave UVA, ultraviolet A light, can come through window glass and 
trigger this rash. And so I'll talk a lot more about light and lupus in a little bit. There are different subtypes of subacute cutaneous lupus, and it's more for me to uh, try to differentiate what the rash is. Sometimes it looks like this woman, and it's fairly obvious. And other times it can look like a common skin disease called psoriasis, and it, it is difficult to tell sometimes clinically. Um, and these patients will typically have antibodies that are positive. Um, Rho is most common. And uh, when you treat this disease, they'll heal without scarring. That's uh, something um, by definition. And we'll use treatment um, for mild cases. We can use topical treatment. Um, that's something a dermatologist is very good at doing, um, using um, topical steroids uh, very liberally and safely. Um, and so we'll use that. Um, if, if that doesn't help, we quickly move on to systemic therapy. Um, a lot of the same treatments you would use for systemic disease. Here is, again, another uh, view of this more common annular polycyclic variant. So annular meaning round, uh, ring-like, and polycyclic meaning think of many rings kind of connecting to each other, and they will typically be on the sun-exposed areas. But you can also see a variant like this that it could be easily misdiagnosed as psoriasis, which is a common skin disease affecting 3% of the population, and you can even have lupus and psoriasis in the same person. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about briefly is drug-induced SCLE. This is actually pretty common, and probably underdiagnosed. So a third of patients with SCLE turn out to have drug-induced SCLE. So the drugs are really commonly prescribed medications, such as um, hypertension medications, um, acid reflux medicines, maybe somebody's treating a toenail fungus with a pill, um, and even some of the um, newer biologic agents can have been reported to induce these rashes too. So a good history um, to figure this out. And it's impossible to tell the difference on this clinical exam or even on laboratory studies if it's drug-induced or not. So you have to have a very thoughtful history. Um, the antibodies can even be positive. Um, okay. And also, uh, tr just removing the drug, by the way, and this doesn't get rid of the rash. You have to treat, and it can take um, even a year for the rash to resolve with maximal therapy. Okay, so, the, so chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus, um, best known as discoid lupus, or DLE. Um, it is most commonly seen on the head and neck, and the most common location is within the scalp. Um, it's, it is the most common type of skin lupus that we see. Um, it is a scarring process, so it's really important to diagnose this early to prevent scarring. So um, as opposed to SCLE, or the butterfly rash, which they can kind of go away and come back or sort of seem to move around. These are fixed, so they'll come up in one spot and stay in one spot, and they'll be around for a very long time. Um, if it affects an area that grows hair, uh, the process is so inflammatory that it can destroy hair follicles. So you can end up with scarring alopecia or scarring hair loss in those areas. Um, and in darker skin tones, as you can see in this eyelid here, you get loss of pigment, and that loss of pigment can be permanent and very disfiguring. Um, so I most, and, and dermatologists most commonly see this in the absence of systemic disease. Um, but again, like I said, it is, um, it is the most common form of cutaneous lupus um, seen in lupus patients as well, in systemic lupus patients. And um, a lot of my patients actually don't have a positive ANA, and, so, and they don't meet criteria for systemic lupus. Um, depending, again, on the study you read, the risk of developing uh, systemic lupus in somebody with chronic cutaneous lupus is fairly low, 5 to 11 percent. Here are some other examples of uh, some of my patients um, who came to me very late into the disease, you know, with very severe disfigurement. And you can see how different skin tones look different. Um, but you can also see the scarring leaves like a step off. It's like a depressed scar, um, and there's no hair growing in this man's beard area, for example, and this woman's scalp. Um, one of the pearls that we teach residents um, is to look in what we call the conchal bowl of the ear, so the inside of the ear, because you'll see uh, early signs of discoid lesions. You'll see plugs where the hair follicles are. We call that follicular plugging, and that's a really good clinical clue to diagnose early lupus. Here are two examples in different skin tones, so you can see how different. And again, um, DLE, or chronic cutaneous lupus, can scar, lead to permanent hair loss and disfigurement, as in these cases. Um, so therapies. 
Um, first, we start um, when it's early. We'll use ultra high potent, uh, potency topical steroids, and then we'll move down to low potency topical steroids depending on how they're doing. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory topicals are also used. So um, you may have heard of them, tacrolimus or pimecrolimus, um, protopic and elidel cream. They're FDA approved for eczema, uh, but we have used them in, um, in lupus with some success. Um, often I will inject steroid right into the lesions in patients, and that works very well at times. And then we quickly proceed on to systemic therapy. So we'll use you know, Plaquenil or Variants, um, and we'll do combination um, anti-malarial medication, and that works very, very well as well. Now, if patients don't respond quickly to these therapies, then we will move on to immunosuppressant medications, much like um, what is used for systemic disease. Um, so, uh, and I do use um, a lot of these pretty often because I see patients with very severe disease and then there are clinical trials going on for um, novel agents. I'm sure Dr. Wallace talked this morning a lot about what's on the horizon. Um, and uh, he um, is on a lot of the clinical trials. But um, some of the things that have worked in skin lupus, and I'm lumping all the skin lupuses together now. Um, so Benlista, Rituxan, Baricitinib is, an, is a newer uh, drug. Um, that shows a lot of promise in skin disease. So hopefully um, once that gets approved and, um, and becomes uh, in use more, we'll see how well it does for skin disease. And um, we borrow from other diseases. So uh, like Rituxan and, and the Baricitinib, those are rheumatoid arthritis drugs. And um, Stelara Ostekinumab is a, is a psoriasis medication. And we try lots of different things um, off-label and we get some um, improvement and then uh, just this morning, I went on um, clinicaltrials.gov. I don't know if you guys know that website. You can all go on it. It's for the um, NIH-funded, National Institutes of Health-funded clinical trials that are open for enrollment or completed and, or they have results. And um, there are lots and lots of investigational therapies out. Dr. Wallace is on a lot of these um, on a lot of these trials, uh, and and hopefully, you know, there'll be some novel agent that comes out soon because we really don't have anything amazing for skin lupus, um, but uh, you know, there may be something out there that's already in use for other diseases that just hasn't found um, its home with skin lupus, and so a lot of these trials are looking at at those as well as a lot of novel agents. Okay, so I talked a little bit about treatment. I talked about what skin lupus looks like, but I'd like to back up and just talk about some of the triggers for lupus. Like I said before, I don't understand lupus. I mean, it's a, it's a very tricky, uh, mysterious disease, but we do understand that sunlight lupus in a lot of people, um, and specifically skin lupus. So uh, that's kind of an important thing to, to talk about and understand because that's something we can uh, try to avoid. I know living especially in Southern California is pretty impossible uh, to avoid completely, but we can do better. Um, so we know that ultraviolet light comes from the sun. It reaches the Earth's surface. So um, there are three types of uh, UV light, UVA, B, and C. UVC, um, thank goodness, is filtered out by our atmosphere. It doesn't come down. It would be ionizing radiation. But A and B do come down. Um, and UVA and UVB both have caused inflammation in lupus and triggered skin lesions. Um, there are other places that we can get UV light on this planet, um, not just from the sun. Um, you know, we don't have as many of those tube monitors anymore, but those would emit UVA light. Um, uncovered fluorescent light bulbs, so they, without the plastic covering UVA, there's UVA light emitted. Uh, tanning beds everywhere um, mainly give UVA light. Um, and let's not forget the most important one that all of us uh, neglect and ignore, which is that UVA light is long wavelength, and it can pass through window glass and it can pass up to six feet away. So if you're sitting up within six feet of window glass, you will get UVA exposure. Um, don't assume that your windshield in your car blocks all the UVA. Um, there was a study a long time ago that showed that dependent, dependent on the manufacturer of the um, windshield, there was a, a good amount of UVA coming through and the side windows in the car definitely allow UVA um, to come through. Uh, so UVB also um, really less common sources, but it's sunlight and tanning beds. Okay, so uh, we know that UV light can induce most types of um, 
lupus specific rashes and skin lesions like we talked about. And also a couple of rare ones that I didn't spend the time to talk about. Maybe in future years, I'll talk more about those. Um, but And skin lesions and rashes in lupus, they can come immediately after sun exposure or it can take weeks to show up. And then the rashes can last weeks, they can last months. And uh, many of you know that it's not just rashes, but also you feel ill, you know, fevers, fatigue, arthritis. Um, you can even spill protein into your urine if you've got some um, uh, kidney involvement with lupus. And so let's talk just briefly. It's a very complex topic. Um, again, I don't know that I really understand all of it, but um, how, how does sunlight actually affect lupus? So I made a little schematic. This is a skin cell. This purple circle is the nucleus where the DNA, um, the genetic material of a cell is housed and protected from the outside world. And this is the cytoplasm. Here's our sun. So ultraviolet light hits a skin cell. If you go to the beach or drive in your car for a while. And what happens is that um, there's a process called apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death that is actually there to protect a cell from sticking around after it's had damage from sunlight, from UV light. And um, there's a process by which proteins that are living inside of the nucleus get shuttled to the surface, and then a whole bunch of signals occur to clear that cell away before it can become a cancerous cell. Well, um, the problem is in um, lupus, you have these circulating antibodies. And these antibodies are against not um, infections, et cetera, but against self. And so the antibodies um, bind to some of these proteins that are normally hidden nicely inside the nucleus, but now are sitting on the surface of the cell waiting for the cleanup crew to come. But instead, the immune system is seeing it. Um, and so that um, creates a cascade of inflammation that leads to the skin cell destruction um, and also to uh, production of more antibody. So um, again, um, UV light, it creates these, what we call it sunburn cells, okay? Um, and so here we have the same cell, right? Normal skin, the UV light hits the cell and um, the cell it goes through those changes where the proteins get shuttled to the surface. The cell kind of uh, involutes a little bit, looks different under the microscope and that sort of signals this cleanup crew to come in and clean up. Well, normally things are cleared out nicely and you don't get cancer, you don't get autoimmunity, but in lupus patients, um, there's something wrong with that system and the cleanup crew just isn't working well. And so you get a lot of these cells hanging out, a lot of these proteins sitting out on the surface waiting to talk to the immune system. And so then the immune system cells come and they talk to those cells and they start taking those proteins back to where antibodies are made and um, the signal is sent, make more antibodies against the cell. And you get this autoantibody formation. And those antibodies can go and deposit in different places like the kidney and cause serious damage. Okay, so um, lupus uh, skin lesions. Uh, in studies, you can actually do this. You can take a person with lupus and you can expose their skin, let's say on their back, to different wavelengths of light, so UV light and you can induce a lupus lesion. So this is a very old study from, I think, uh, almost 20 years ago, um, where they took quite a few patients and they did this series and they were able to show that, you know, UV, in this one patient, UVA light, UVB light, and UVA plus UVB light can induce a lesion of lupus. So kind of proof of concept. Um, so they, these are all the different types of, of patients um, with different types of lupus in the skin, okay? And they showed that um, if you just look here, you know, 45 to 76% um, of those patients, were, they were, the researchers were able to elicit a lupus lesion by um, exposing them to a small amount of um, UV light. And you can see it can be UVA, UVB, or both together. And, um, and so that was very interesting. Now, patients though, when I ask them, when they come into the office, are you sensitive to light? That's sort of like a question I ask and, and um, we get a lot of yeses or a lot of no's. And so this same group kind of wanted to figure out how reliable is the patient's um, history taking on this. And so they asked these patients, you know, 94 of them, um, are you photosensitive? 94 of them said yes and 71 of them said no. And then they tested them with that test that I showed you. And they found that of the people who said that or thought that they were photosensitive, 
38% of them actually did not, they could not reproduce a lupus lesion. It's very interesting. And then of 71 patients who didn't think that they were photosensitive, 58% of them, they were able to elicit a lupus rash in them. Um, so why? I mean, how can you be so unreliable? Well, they went on to look at how long it took after you shine the light on them to when you get a rash. And I think that is where the answer is. Because if you look at this old graph, um, the black lines are a condition called polymorphous light erupt eruption. It's like a sun allergy that people, normal people can have. You don't have to have lupus to get it. And um, those people go in the sun and then um, one to seven days later, they develop a rash. So they remember, okay, I went and sat on the beach on Saturday. On Thursday, I got a rash. They connected and they say, okay, I'm allergic to the sun. However, if you look at the gray here, these patients, uh, many of them won't start getting rashes until a week later, and some as far as three weeks later. Many of them have already forgotten about their sun exposure, and they don't make the connection. I think that's why the history is somewhat unreliable. Okay, so then the next question is what do we do? So we can live inside of a dark room, or we can protect our skin. Um, and so sunscreen, does it really work? And so this was a nice study that looked at a broad-spectrum sun. Uh, sunscreen and looked at patients both in who had lupus, cutaneous lupus or skin lupus, and also with just healthy controls. And they looked at whether or not they could block the production of a lupus lesion with sunscreen. So um, these patients um, uh, were, so patient A, I think patient A and B were lupus patients. And um, this is without the application of the sunscreen plus UV light. And then this is with the application of this, uh, without the, uh, excuse me, with, this is without application of sunscreen, shine on UV light, shine UV light on the skin. This is plus the sunscreen, shine the same amount of UV light. And you can see that no rash occurred where the sunscreen was applied. This is another patient, same thing. UV light, you get a lupus lesion, UV light plus sunscreen, you block it. Um, and these are all unique patients. So that was a good proof of concept too. And in this study, they looked at um, different types of lupus lesions to see whether or not sunscreen could prevent all different types. And indeed it did. You can see this is subacute cutaneous lupus, the discoid lupus. And this one I didn't talk about, which is something called tumid lupus. It's rare, but very sensitive to sun. And you can see that um, they, um, you can see 40% uh, percent of patients got a rash with um, out sunscreen applied, zero with sunscreen. 25% uh, got a rash here, but zero with sunscreen. And 80% of these patients uh, got a rash with the UV light, but when they apply the sunscreen, it stopped that reaction, okay? And um, these are um, uh, also healthy controls. HCs are healthy controls. And so um, they weren't getting, they needed an extra control group. Like, so do, can you make, do you just make lupus with this experiment? And the answer is no, unless you already have lupus. Okay. Um, so my message to you is sun protection. Okay. So there are many, many ways to protect from the sun these days, which is great. Um, so lots and lots of different sunscreens, a lot of bad information out on the internet about sunscreens, a lot that we don't actually know. We could come back and talk about sunscreens another year, actually, because it's a very long topic. But I will tell you that different skin tones can handle sunscreen differently, and we acknowledge that. So people with very light skin can handle um, these physical blocking sunscreens or these chemical-free sunscreens called with zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. But if you try to put that on brown or black skin, it's just going to look white, and it's just not elegant and not practical. And so we're left with the chemical sunscreens, um, which work very, very well. And so you're looking for um, some uh, ingredients like Mexoril and the Helioplex and the Neutrogena line, which are very, very helpful. Now, some people uh, don't want to use sunscreen or they can't tolerate sunscreen. So we have to remember there are other ways to protect ourselves. You can purchase sun protective clothing. You can walk around with a parasol. Um, you can do things to um, treat your windows in your environment. Um, look for the UPF 50 plus label on clothing. Um, it's everywhere now, which is nice. Costco has it. REI has it. Target has it. Um, uh, you can find all the companies online. Um, it's about how the weave is, is uh, made in the cloth. 
um, that it blocks the UVA and UVB very, very effectively, I would argue better than sunscreen. Um, it, it lasts for a while. I mean, you can't use the same piece of clothing that you've washed 100 times for five years. It won't keep the same um, sun protection factor, but they last for quite a while. Um, okay, so uh, how does sunscreen work? I think people kind of want to know that. Um, so there are different types of sunscreen. We talked about that um, a minute ago. There are the physical blockers or the chemical free ones, and then there's the chemical sunscreen. Um, everybody likes to talk about everything organic, and it's kind of the opposite thinking in sunscreens. So the organic sunscreens are actually the, um, the chemical sunscreens. It has nothing to do with organic, like food, so forget that. Um, so if you see organic written on a sunscreen bottle, it's kind of a marketing silliness and doesn't really mean anything. Um, so um, the physical blockers or the chemical-free sunscreens are, like I said, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, and they work by being little mirrors. They're mirrors that sit on the top of the skin. And they just take the light from the sun and they reflect it right back out into the environment. So nothing happens to the UV rays. They just get reflected back. But they do tend to leave a white sheen. And so darker skin tones um, don't do great with them. Although the micronizing um, technology, the nanotechnology has made it much better. And um, so they do, a lot of them do go on much more sheer than they used to. Um, then there's the chemical sunscreens. Those are the, the wide variety of sunscreens, lots of different um, ingredients. A lot of these have been implicated in the destruction of coral reefs and do they have hormone-like effects, et cetera. Um, and so, like I said, I can't talk all about that today, but it's interesting. Um, but these act a little differently. They, they are small molecules. They'll sit on the skin surface. They'll absorb UV light. And then because they have a complex set of bonds, they'll vibrate off the heat as infrared. Um, so they also, though, they sit on the skin surface. It's not that they're getting absorbed to work. Everything is a coat on the skin, okay? Um, these go on clear. They're great for dark skin, um, but, you know, we can't have irritation with those, especially if somebody has a lot of lupus on their skin. They may not handle the chemical sunscreens very well. Okay, one more thing I want to talk about, which is this crystalline window film, which is great. So um, 3M makes this, and there are a lot of um, knockoffs of it, which are much less expensive. Um, but I try to talk to my patients about getting this done. If you, if you own your car, um, I would consider spending a little bit of money on this. We spend so much time in the car in LA. That's a lot of our UVA exposure. And UVA is constant throughout the year and through cloudy days. So um, remember that even in the winter time, you're getting the same UVA light that you're getting in the summer. So this blocks like 99% of um, UVA and UVB. It blocks a lot of um, uh, the infrared as well. So your, your car doesn't get heated up but they make it in a totally clear tint. It has also darker ones, but totally clear means it's legal. You don't ask your doctor for a note. You don't get in a car accident because it's too dark on the side and you can't see the cars. So I like this one and, and um, I think it is very helpful. Okay, switching gears completely. One of the biggest reasons patients with lupus come in to see me is for hair loss, right? It's really common. So this is the one non-lupus specific skin thing that I'll talk about today. Um, so. Hair loss in a lupus patient is a complicated subject, and often there are many reasons for hair loss in one individual person. Um, and I'll talk about these, okay? Uh, so the lupus-associated hair loss, here are um, two exa examples of it, okay? So it affects the entire scalp, and it does correlate with disease activity. Um, often we'll find short, broken hairs and baby hairs, especially in the frontal hairline. We call them the lupus fuzzies. They're hairs that seem to not grow back even after the disease is controlled very well. And um, uh, the treatment really for this, to be honest, is, is not hair directed. It is systemic disease directed. If you don't get the systemic disease under control, the hair is the outward expression of what's happening internally. We don't really have great treatments um, for that, and there are a lot of things out on the market for hair loss, I wouldn't fall into the trap of spending lots of money on that because it's not likely to help if the disease is not under great control. Um, and sometimes we physicians will have a hard time understanding whether or not this is a medication-induced hair loss or lupus-induced hair loss. And as you know, you read the package insert for every medication, and it says hair loss with it, uh, including our favorite Plaquenil, right? So that, that can be very, very tricky to figure out. Um, so telogen effluvium in lupus, okay? So telogen effluvium is a really common cause of hair shedding. It's a sudden shift of the hair cycle from the growing phase 
to the shedding phase and um, it show, it's hundreds and hundreds of hairs in your hairbrush all over your bathroom, et cetera. And it can be associated with a lupus flare or with inadequate control of inflammation. It is reversible though. So it can last for many months, but it should stop. And um, one thing that I always check for when someone presents with the telogen effluvium, especially if their disease seems under control, is to look for thyroid disease because thyroid disease is very common in lupus patients. Discoid lupus, you've seen lots of pictures of it, right? So you get discrete areas of scaly discoloration with itching or burning, and then hair disappears. If treated early, the hair can, be, can regrow, okay? If it looks like this woman, the hair in these areas is not going to regrow, but the surrounding areas are threatened. And if treated early, we can save those areas, okay? Uh, alopecia areata, which is circular hair loss, um, can pr progress to full head of hair loss. Um, that is commonly seen in lupus. It's a totally distinct autoimmune disorder. Um, and so we see lots of patients who have no evidence of lupus but do develop this disease. Um, it is considered non-scarring, okay? And so um, we see these well-demarcated patches of hair loss. Um, sometimes the scalp looks tiny bit pink or people have pink scalps and Suddenly you see the scalp, so you're like, is this pink because of the hair loss or is it just a pink scalp? So it can be confused with discoid lupus early on. Uh, sometimes you need a skin biopsy to be able to tell um, if it's a scarring or non-scarring process. Um, and the activity is typically not mirroring the disease activity in lupus if the person has lupus. And then again, look for thyroid disease because um, these patients um, can, can also have autoimmune thyroid disease. Um, and so we'll treat with a lot of different treatments. I, this is not an alopecia areata talk, but we might start with topical or injection steroids and um, certain drugs like uh, our rheumatoid arthritis medication, Zeljans, tofacitinib, has been recently shown to grow hair in alopecia areata. Okay, uh, female pattern hair loss in lupus. So female pattern hair loss affects quite a tremendous percentage of, of people. Uh, lupus and not, not lupus sufferers, uh, and so it's a really common issue. Um, the problem with female pattern hair loss is it's a, it comes on top of lupus, and so um, even if you control the disease and everything is going well and all the acute forms of hair loss are controlled, often, um, especially women, will, will have uh, this thinning um, throughout their scalp, uh, mostly in the frontal scalp, when we define it as having a wide part, like you see more scalp when you, when you part the hair. And um, uh, it really, these are the ones I just told you about, um, it's really a genetic issue where we start with a certain density of hair, and as we all get older, our dense, hair density decreases, and that's just genetically determined. We don't have control over it. The problem is when someone has lupus, they'll have these abrupt hair losses, and that'll kind of bring you onto your curve a little earlier, even decades or two decades earlier. And so you'll have much less hair um, than you would have had if you didn't have lupus. And it is really kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, we can do skin biopsies to help determine the difference between these different um, uh, types of hair loss. But really, we kind of assess the patient, make sure the thyroid is normal, make sure that there's no anemia, make sure lupus is under great control. And if there's nothing left and the pattern fits, we fit them into this female pattern hair loss. Um, and treatments are, are really not that successful in everybody, but we try them because that's what we have. And so you guys know about Rogaine uh, or Minoxidil, which is topically applied. Uh, there are oral um, agents. So testosterone is actually important in um, female pattern thinning and male pattern thinning by blocking testosterone. You can try to get some hair growth, and that can be done with um, finasteride and spironolactone, um, you know, wigs, extensions, changing your hairstyle, um, in severe cases, hair transplantation. And then there was one more that I wanted to talk about today, which is kind of new since last time I, I came and talked about hair loss, which is PRP injections. I don't know if you guys have heard of those. Um, so platelet-rich plasma. Um, so uh, we've been using platelet-rich plasma in our office for about six months for hair loss, and it's not just for lupus patients. I'd say predominantly non-lupus patients. We're getting some pretty good results. Um, we treat these patients, and I'll go over what the treatment is, um, monthly for four months, and then they would get another session like every three to 12 months, depending on the hair, how it's going. And that would be for life because this process is progressive. Um, so uh, there are some clinical trials. I will tell you they're poorly designed, and they are sponsored by the makers of these, this technology. Um, 
but they are showing some efficacy. There are some nice um, laboratory studies showing why it would work. Um, at, unfortunately, not covered by insurance. It's very pricey. So what do they do? Okay. So what we do is we have patient come into the office. They get their blood drawn. The blood is put in a special tube, and it's spun down. And it's the same amount of blood that three regular lab tubes would be. Um, then afterwards, the, the blood is separated. The red and the white cells are separated from the platelets, okay, the blood clotting um, uh, cells, and the plasma, which is the liquid part of your blood. And those are isolated, and they're actually injected right into the scalp. And so it's about 15 to 30 injections with a very small needle. It takes about five minutes to do. Um, you leave with uh, little lumps on your head, and that lasts for about 20 minutes. Um, you can uh, do everything you need to do, shower, exercise, et cetera. Uh, you might have a bit of a headache. Tylenol helps. Um, and then you hope for the best. Come back once a month. And um, we have seen some really nice hair growth um, with it. And I have done it in a few lupus patients, and we've done well. And I, my feeling, though, is that it's not treating the lupus. It's treating the con concomitant female pattern hair loss. Um, so what's in PRP? Why is it working? Well, we have the platelets. And uh, lots of growth factors, okay? I won't go through all the details of these, but these have been isolated. They promote growth of cells. They pr promote wound healing. They promote blood, blood vessel regrowth, tissue repair, collagen production, um, et cetera. So we think those are things that are all important in stimulating hair follicles to produce nice, healthy hairs. Okay, so this is the conclusion. Um, just a plug for dermatology. Why do, you, why do you need us in your treatment team? Um, so a lot of times it's really hard to know what's going on with your skin when you have lupus. Um, so rashes can look really nonspecific, and they're often misdiagnosed. So you're allowed to have other things happen to your skin besides lupus when you have lupus, right? You can get infections. You can get things like acne or rosacea, or you can get another disease like psoriasis. And uh, we help you understand that and so that you're not over-treated for lupus um, and you're not under-treated for the other, the other diseases. Um, and we are really good at managing topical treatment. So there's a lot of fear with using topical steroids, cortisones on the skin, right? The pharmacists like to scare everybody that it's going to thin the skin and cause stretch marks, et cetera. But really under our guidance, you can use them very safely and for longer periods of time than, says that in, than it says on the package insert or the pharmacist tells you you can do. And we can change the strengths and we can assess accurately and early if you're responding or not. And we can move on to systemic medications quickly. Um, and know when they're working and when they're not working. And then finally, we can bug you about sun protection because I don't think any of us do that enough for our patients. And we don't, especially living here, we don't do it enough. None of us do. And it is really important in controlling disease. And I've had many patients who didn't respond to anything until we started protecting them well from the sun. And I think that's it. So I think we have time for questions. Thank you. Are we doing them just by cards or raising hands? I think we're doing it by cards, yeah. How much time do we have? Pepper, how much time? Just so I don't want to. Okay, it's what time is it now? Five to two? Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip any questions that have to do with like a personal case, but if you want to come talk to me after, I'm happy to try to help you out. Okay, uh, let's see. Is SPF an everyday lotion enough to protect? Great question. 
So the answer is yes and no. Um, in 2014, the FDA and the American Academy of Dermatology teamed together to revise the sunscreen requirements in this country. And so there are certain minimum requirements um, that didn't exist before. If you see the words broad spectrum uh, protection on the bottle of makeup of sunscreen, you're in good shape. That means it meets minimum requirements of at least a sun protection factor of 15 and also blocks UVA light adequately, okay? So that's what you're looking for. Okay, did you say PRP injections work well with male type hair loss? I didn't say, but it absolutely does. And I would say most of the um, studies and experience in the hair restoration community is really for male pattern hair loss. I'm using PRP mostly for male and female pattern hair loss, not in association with lupus, but I have quite a few patients with lupus who are seeking out that treatment and I am treating them. I don't really have great data to say anything about lupus this year, but maybe in a few years I will. But it works great in men. Okay, can lupus patients have laser treatments, IPL, to treat broken capillaries? Very good question. There's actually, from this morning when I went on to the clinical trials, um, .gov website, there was a trial open on using a pulse dye laser in lupus. So um, I forget, it's not in this country, it was in another country. But we have been using um, laser in lupus patients. Um, I will tell you there are always exceptions to the rule. So um, there have been a patient or two that seems to have flared with an IPL. But IPL um, is really in the visible spectrum and infrared. And so we don't think that triggers lupus in most patients, although I want to argue that visible light probably does have some role in triggering lupus. Um, but in general, we will use IPL, um, intense pulse light, um, or pulse dye laser, or other laser modalities in lupus patients to help with the broken capillaries and some of the leftover redness when the lupus rashes heal. More, okay, okay. Can lupus patients use a phone app to check UVA and B and not have to cover up? The answer is, I think not, unless you have an adapter on your phone that has an, a UV meter. I have a feeling there is something out there, but just shining your phone in the sunlight, there's no way for that phone to be that smart to be able to tell what the UV index is. Um, and so I would tell you as a general rule though, if you're outdoors in Southern California, you need to cover up if the sun is shining, okay? And the sun is shining from early morning until late evening here. Um, and remember that UVA light is long wavelength and it can travel through things. It can even travel through t-shirt uh, material. But if the clouds are out, assume the UVB is blocked somewhat, but because you're not feeling that heat, the heat is from the UVB and the infrared, um, but the, um, the UVA light is coming through, okay? More, okay. Hives with lupus treatment. I don't know what that means exactly other than hives can really be an initial presentation of lupus. Hives can occur as an allergic reaction to treatments. It's a very tricky subject. The person who asked me this question come to me later maybe to, for more specific answers. How often should you reapply sun protection throughout the day? Oh, if you read the back of the bottle, it says every two hours and every 80 minutes if you're in water. Um, I don't know anybody who does that. That's tough. Um, so that's the, the correct answer is every two hours. Um, a lot of women have a struggle with that, right? Because you put your makeup on and, and so what are you supposed to do? So the workaround that we have, there are a lot of beautiful tinted uh, moisturizers with a very high SPF. Um, and so we love those and you can put those right back on your skin. If you're in the office all day, I don't know that you, and you're not rubbing your face, I don't think you absolutely need to reapply. But if you're outdoors, I would. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. Okay. Does lupus accelerate the diminishment or loss of collagen in the face, um, body skin? The answer is, I don't know, but I can tell you that the treatments, namely steroids, do that. Yeah, so if you've needed systemic steroids, you can lose a lot of collagen from that, unfortunately. Uh, malar rash. Many patients report stress, heat, and fatigue as triggers of their malar rashes. What research is being done to understand these factors and using lifestyle modification as a way to mediate malar rashes? Great question. I don't think I'm the expert to tell you what clinical trials um, are going on for that um, and what studies are going on, but uh, we definitely know that um, stress 
we, we hear that from everybody. Um, so I, I don't have a better answer for you, sorry. Okay, what is a good remedy, preferably topical, natural, and or homeopathic that can be used to treat bruising caused by injections of lupus pharmaceuticals at the injection site? Okay, uh, like methotrexate, for example. Um, okay, so the homeopathic things that we know about, whether or not they really work is a different story. Um, Arnica, which is a flower, is uh, found in a lot of homeopathic um, stores. You can find it in Whole Foods. It can be used, um, given as a sublingual tablet uh, with no known medication interaction, so you can safely use it. It can also be um, applied topically as a cream or a gel, um, and that is supposed to help with bruising and inflammation. Um, you can try that. Bromelain, which is uh, pineapple core, is also, I think, used. And uh, again, I don't really know that we have strong studies to say that it works, but it's certainly safe. Uh, how do we stop or limit? And then, by the way, for the methotrexate, um, injection technique may be part of your problem. Um, and so you might want to go over that with a nurse and see if there's a better way for you to inject to avoid the bruising. Uh, it might be a needle change or maybe the angle that you're injecting, um, the way you stretch your skin. Um, icing beforehand also can help. Okay, so how do we stop or limit hair falling out in patches? This is a very general question that um, I can't really answer because it there's like I explained, there's so many causes to the hair loss, so I don't I don't think I can answer that um, one. All right, so uh, very good question. Lupus patients already have tainted blood cell T cells, blood T cells. So how much benefit can one receive from PRP hair treatments? Great question. So PRP actually eliminates the T cells from um, what you're injecting in. So all your the T cells are are getting discarded actually. So all the lymphocytes are getting discarded, and we're just injecting the plasma, which has growth factors in the serum, and um, also the platelets, which have lots of factors in them. And the answer is I don't know how much benefit the lupus patients are getting because. Nobody's published on this yet, and uh, maybe one day we will. Um, but right now, we're getting some anecdotal um, improvement. Okay. So do you find certain medications can cause changes in skin, particularly discoloration or yellowing of the skin? Uh, yeah. So uh, I think the one that's classically known is quinacrine. I don't know if anybody's on that one. It's an old anti-malarial medication. It's not commercially available, uh, so we compound it um, through compounding pharmacies, and that one does cause a yellowish discoloration of the skin. It's usually not permanent, but can be long-lasting after you discontinue the medicine. It tends to be pretty subtle, and so for a lot of my patients, they'll notice it themselves, but nobody else says that they see, that their friends see that they're yellow. Uh, does Plaquenil affect your hair? Great question. I've had two patients in my career um, that I believe I'm convinced that Plaquenil led to some hair loss, but the thousands of other patients is the opposite experience. Plaquenil is known to reduce the severity of uh, lupus, to decrease the frequency of flares, um, to help with all kinds of pro-inflammatory markers, and it, it too also allows hair to regrow in more healthily. Um, that being said, we don't prescribe Plaquenil for patients who have hair loss who don't have lupus or a related condition. It doesn't work. Okay, how to reapply sunscreen before you makeup? We talked about that. Do physical sunscreens break down over time under sun just like chemical sunscreens? Probably not. Probably, they probably don't break down. Uh, but they're rubbed off, sweat off, et cetera. Are vertical ridges in the nail bed related to autoimmune disorders? Um, probably not. So vertical ridging is normal as an age-related change. When you say vertical, I'm assuming you mean up and down this way and not across the nail. And that is something that can be seen in uh, healthy people who are just getting older from lack of hydration of the nail plate. Um, okay. And then is dermabrasion safe with lupus? Uh, you know, the benefits, uh, so are we talking dermabrasion or microdermabrasion? Microdermabrasion, which is available in a lot of salons, um, there really isn't much benefit to that treatment, so I probably wouldn't do it anyway. I would probably pick some other things for rejuvenation. Dermabrasion is something very specific for, uh, real, basically, you can imagine someone taking sandpaper and scraping your skin off. That's dermabrasion. And uh, it would all depend on the lupus patient and why the person's having dermabrasion. This day and age, with um, a lot of laser technology, chemical peeling, dermabrasion is done less often and is often restricted to like post-surgical scars. So if you have a skin cancer on your face and your nose doesn't heal well from it, um, they might dermabrade your nose to get the skin to smooth out um, well. Okay, so uh, let's see. Somebody asked about the sunscreen frequency. We talked about that. Uh, 
So is, it is usually recommended to do at-home injections in the abdomen or thigh. Why can't the lower back or buttocks not be used um, like they do in the doctor's office? That has to do with the type of injection. So if you're injecting something at home like Ben Lista, um, and you're giving yourself a subcutaneous injection, you're putting it into the fat, and that is um, best done in areas that have lots of fat. Um, so abdomen or thigh are fattier areas because you don't want to end up in a muscle. Intramuscular injections can't be done in the abdomen because the medicine will end up in the fat. And um, when it's done in the buttock, it's done to go for uh, the muscle, the gluteus muscle, um, and so that it's not in the fat. Okay. Uh, I think we covered everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Abuov. That was really great. We appreciate it. We do have some of our cards out on our info table, so if you'd like her contact information, you can find it there, um, or you can contact me, and I can also give you her contact information. Thank you so much. That was really great. We did um, run over just a little bit, so we're going to take a shorter break. So about a five-minute break, um, stretch your legs, grab some water, use the restroom, and then we'll be back for our next presentation. We still have two more really great ones. Thank you, everybody.